Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and the 1010 concurrent enrollment class. We are working now with the St. Martin's Guide to Writing lecture number 13. We are in part four, research strategies, chapters 17 through 21. Now, here is what we will call the consideration of the historical precedent. About anything that we want to write about, we ask the simple question, has anyone or a group of someones had anything to say on this topic? Most of the time, as the writer of Ecclesiastes reminds us, nothing new under the sun, most of the time there will be somebody or a group of somebodies that has said something about our topic. We think about Jefferson's classic Declaration of Independence. Go back to learnstrong.net and take a look at our lecture there. That amazing piece of composition, of persuasion, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary. Now, of course, the wording of necessary, we've talked about why that's significant. But that point in the course of human events is that consideration of the historical precedent. So we're going to take a look at part four, chapter 17 through 21 quickly, at some research strategies. In chapter 17, we're going to look at planning and conducting research. In chapter 18, selecting and evaluating sources. Chapter 19, using sources to support our ideas. And then in chapter 20, we're going to talk about citation method for the MLA style book. And then finally, chapter 21, the citation method for the American Psychological Association, APA style book. Let's go through this quickly now, starting in chapter 17, planning and coordinating research. So we're going to begin, first of all, by analyzing the rhetorical situation and setting a schedule so important as writers that we do this. How many times have we come up with this amazing idea, but we just don't have enough time to be able to finish the paper that we're wanting to write? So right away, we've got to pay attention to energy conservation model as we talk about it in 303. Of course, choosing a topic on page 521 and getting an overview, we obviously use jam writing as a way to do that, to begin to kind of come up with some idea of what it is that we want to say. Obviously, general encyclopedias, top of page 522, especially the Britannica Online is the one we recommend more than Wikipedia, obviously, right? And research guides as well. We're going to focus on 522, our topic. We're going to draft using research questions, and we're going to establish a research log. Obviously, typing all of this makes sense so that you can copy and paste quickly to be able to create your uh, papers and obviously your works cited page. We're going to develop a list of search terms on page 523. We're going to create a working bibliography and then, of course, the annotated bibliography. Sometimes this is confusing to students, so look at it on 523. Annotated bibliography will provide an overview of sources that we are considering, and they will answer these questions. What kind of source is it? What's the main point of the source? How might I use the source? How might my sources be related? That's a huge one, right? And then, of course, what information will I need to cite the source? That's also a uh, big, we'll get to that one here in a little bit. Of course, the taking notes on your sources on page 524, um, at least three, summarizing accurately using our own words and sentence structures, paraphrasing without borrowing the language or sentence structure of the source, and quoting accurately and placing all language from the source in quotation marks. Now we introduce ourselves to, of course, the, a review on page 525 of how we can find sources, both secondary sources as well as primary sources, and are searching through library catalogs and databases in a unified search on page 525. 526, they're going to recommend, as we've said many times, that using the appropriate search ter terms when we're working with Google or other kinds of databases, we're going to broaden or narrow our results, and as well, of course, finding books. We don't want to forget that while we do live in this time when everything is provided online, lots of books are provided online, and often they can be a tremendous help to us. Especially um, students have learned how to use Amazon as a way to find what has been most recently published on my topic. Sometimes Amazon's the best way to go there. Of course, periodicals, journals on page 528. This is hypercritical. We're going to get to Google Scholar in a little bit on 530. But obviously the databases and the use of the, of the school media consultant or librarian to help us with all of that is hypercritical. They give you some good ideas on 530 for finding government documents and statistical information. That's really important 
to be able to find the most current, up-to-date stats, and that's a great place to go. Of course, websites and interactive sources are also produced, and of course, Google Scholar, we, we recommend Google Scholar, and of course, the other databases as well. The interactive source work on page 531 of blogs, of wikis, of social networking sites, discu uh, discussion lists. I had a student who was working on a paper, found the expert in the field, simply emailed her and said, I'm a student and I'm working on this. Do you have any suggestions for me? The student was blown away at how quickly the professor returned the email with all kinds of information. So how we search is obviously important. Conducting field research on 531, obviously the observational studies um, mentioned on 532 are of importance as well as conducting the interviews. Great, great bits of advice here on conducting the interview on 533 and on conducting surveys on 534. Chapter 18, selecting and evaluating sources. Obviously, we're going to be thinking about what is relevant, what can help us achieve our aim um, with our readers by explaining terms, concepts, I'm just reading on 535, providing background information, providing evidence in support of our claims, providing alternate viewpoints or interpretations, and then finally, obviously, lending authority to our point of view. This is a great bit of work on 536. Take a look closely at this figure 18.1, analyzing the detailed record of an article from a periodical database, just to make sure you know how to read appropriately. And then the evaluation of source work that starts on 537, six big questions we must ask if we're going to ask about a source. First of all, who wrote it, right? Um, um, that's, that's significant right away. Secondly, how recently was it published? By the way, just to go back to number one, this is why we don't work on the open net, because so often on the open net, you can't answer the simple question, who wrote this? You're gonna find somebody who maybe manages the site, but you have no idea who wrote it. If you have a name, obviously you wanna run down that name. Who is this individual? And then obviously in the setup to your quote or your paraphrase or summary or your, your piece of external validation, you're gonna tell us a little bit about that somebody to make sure we know who actually provides the information that you're citing. Number two on page 538, how recently was it published? Obviously timeliness is, matter, is, is a matter for us. Again, within the last five years is what we're hoping for. Number three, is the source scholarly, popular, or of a trade or for a trade group? Make sure you understand the differences between the three, noting especially, obviously, scholarly source work. 539, the fourth question, who published it? That is significant, as well as number question number five on 541, how is the source written? And then, of course, finally, what does the source actually say? All right? Chapter 19, using sources to support our ideas. We call this, obviously, validation and citation methodologies. Before we get there, though, let's talk a little bit about synthesizing sources. Synthesizing meaning making connections, right, among information and ideas from texts and from your own experience. This is hypercritical if we're going to be good readers and obviously good writers, right? Sentence structures, like on 543, a study by X supports my position by demonstrating that blank. X and Y think this issue is about blank, but what it is really at stake here is blank. We obviously played this game in some of the papers we were working with. Let's go ahead now and turn to the P word. You knew this was coming on 543, plagiarism. Acknowledging sources, avoiding plagiarism, why we use Turnitin, of course, in our 20% threshold um, as well. The questions begin with what does and does not need to be acknowledged. Okay, um, it, I, I just want to jump to the very bottom of 543. The documentation guidelines in the next two chapters present two styles for citing sources, the MLA and the APA stylos. Whichever style you use, and obviously in our course we use predominantly the MLA style book, the most important thing, and now I'm reading at the top of 544, is that your readers be able to tell where words or ideas that are not your own begin and end. And go back and read that line again. You can accomplish this most readily by placing parenthetical source citations correctly and by separating your words from those of the source with signal phrases such as according to Smith, Peter's claims, we've talked about these attribution verbs, you want to create a bank of these attribution verbs so that you're not writing all the way through your whole paper so-and-so says, so-and-so says, so-and-so says, so-and-so claims, so-and-so infers, so-and-so reports. Obviously, these are important, the, attribu the attribution, so-and-so asserts, etc., right? 
Now we've got to avoid plagiarism by acknowledging sources and quoting, paraphrasing, obviously summarizing carefully. I'm just reading from page 544. Remember especially the need to document electronic sources fully and accurately. So important. Another reason uh, they, they point out, and I think this is absolutely true, often students are caught plagiarizing, they didn't know that it was plagiarizing. So for example, they're in a history course and they hand in a paper that they wrote in a 1010 course, they wrote the paper and they can't believe that they're being accused of plagiarizing, self-plagiarizing. We never want to hand in a paper that even we wrote for another instructor without letting that instructor know. Now some instructors don't care. They're, you're in an anthropology class, I wrote this paper in my history class, is it alright if I submit it to you? And often the instructor will say, I have no problem with that. Some instructors will say, yeah, I have a problem with that, write another paper for me. And if that's the case, you want to write another paper. But I think sometimes students do plagiarize without actually realizing that they're plagiarizing. Or, at the bottom of 544, Axel Rod Cooper hits it, hits it nicely. You can tell they're profs. Another reason some people plagiarize is they feel intimidated by the writing task or the deadline. If you experience this anxiety about your work, speak to your instructor. Do not run the risk of failing a course or being expelled from your college because of plagiarism. So important. If you're confused about what it is, whether it's plagiarism or not, be sure to ask your instructor, consult your school's plagiarism policy. You all signed a plagiarism policy at the beginning of the school year. Obviously, we want to pay attention to this. 545. Using information from sources to support claims. Obviously, we're going to do this for three primary reasons on 545. Stating a claim that supports our thesis, providing evidence that supports our claim, and explaining to readers how the evidence supports our claim. And then they give you a really good example of that on 545 uh, to, to make sure that, again, you're reviewing this. On 546, we want to decide whether to quote, paraphrase, or to summarize as a rule. Notice it, quote, only in these four situations. When the wording of the source is particularly memorable or vivid or expresses a technical point, you can't rephrase clearly. Two, when a respected authority's words would lend support to your position. Three, when you wish to cite another, uh, to cite an author whose opinions challenge or vary greatly from those of other experts. And finally, four, when you're going to discuss the source's choice of words. Of course, copy quotations exactly, or use italics, ellipses, or brackets to indicate changes. And of course, you will always use the letters S-I-C if there is some kind of misspelling or an error in the direct quote. Study that closely to make sure you understand how to do that on 546. Using italicis for emphasis, or using italis, uh, ellipsis marks for omissions on 547, and then of course using brackets for insertion or changes as well as adjusting the punctuation within quotations on 548, and then uh, avoiding grammatical tangles, right? You want to make sure that you don't have problems, especially with your verb or your sentence fragments issues, okay? Finally, 549, the use of in-text or blocked quotations, in-text quotations at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end on 550, or divided by your own words, and then block quotations in the MLA style book, uh, use the block form for prose quotations of five or more typed lines. In the ABA style, you use the block form for quotations of 40 words or more. All right? Finally, punctuation to integrate quotations into your writing, introducing the quote using a colon, a colon uh, on page 550. On 551, use, uh, introducing the quotation using a comma, of course, using, uh, the, introducing the quote using that, right? Paraphrasing sources carefully is the last thing that's mentioned in this chapter, and of course, writing summaries that present the source's main ideas in a balanced and readable way. Students are often blown away by the amount of work it takes to write a good academic paper simply because they have to do so much reading. They're kind of, they're kind of shocked by that. I just wanted to write a paper on gun control. I didn't realize I was going to be reading hundreds of pages of what everybody else was saying, then I have to distill all that information down. It's a lot of work, which is, again, why you have to have a good schedule and to understand your energy conservation and the time that's allowed. Finally, very quickly, we want to work through chapters 2021 20, and the two style books that are most prevalent on university campuses, the MLA style book, the APA style book. You'll notice that you have color code on page 555 on the edge. You'll have the what, orange color for the MLA, the blue color for the APA, and you want to be able to differentiate between the two. 
Okay, I want to point out right away on page 555, you see that website, www.mla.org. That you want to hit right away to make sure that you understand exactly what's going on. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the MLA style book because the information is all provided for you here. However, I will point out on page 559 the creating of a list of works cited. We don't call it references in MLA, that's APA. Creating a, a list of works cited. Notice they're working here with the MLA handbook, the 8th edition. If it has changed and gone to another edition, then be aware of that. But you do have 10 things you want to pay attention to on 559, uh, 560. And then they'll give you an exemplar of this on 560. The formatting of your list of works cited is also important on 561. Four things there that you want to make sure. Starting, of course, with the works cited at the top. Now, to just make sure that this is all clear and um, and by the way, do note your articles, your print, your online databases on 566. Just to make sure, though, that this is clear, and your multimedia sources on 570, uh, and your other electronic sources on 572. But just to make sure this is clear, jump over to page 574, 575. You want to study this closely. I pointed out, this is one of the advantages of Axelrod Cooper, spending an hour with pages 575 and following will save you an, an inordinate amount of, uh, of time later on. You want to format exactly the way this looks, and then follow closely all of the annotations on the side, especially page 581. Your works cited page needs to look like page 581's works cited page. All right, beginning obviously with a works cited there, and then of course you have the alphabetical order of the last name first. Chapter 21, starting on page 583, will simply tell you what the APA style book looks like. There's not a tremendous number of differences, but you want to pay attention to page 593. That is the references page of an APA styled um, um, paper, and you want to make sure you see the differences between that and the 581 MLA style book. Okay? Well, there you go, guys. An introduction, a lot of information. Hopefully, most of it is just reviewed for you. Again, if you've got questions, make sure you ask them so you can avoid that plagiarizing. Thank you.